Boker Tov. Can we practice our Hebrew this morning and say together, Boker Tov. Now stretch up and give a shout to the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Good morning to you. And I must say, when, uh, when Dr. Saif asked me to, to come uh, uh, to be part of this bless, bless Israel event, I was a little bit surprised because it's quite a rarity to me to speak to a non-Jewish crowd. Most of the crowd that I'm dealing with is, is truly a Jewish, uh, a Jewish crowd. You see, because I was raised up in Israel, I want to take a minute or two and tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I was raised up in Israel in a very religious Jewish community. Matter of fact, I thought everybody in the world is Jewish. I didn't know there was such a thing as Gentiles. <laughs> Gentiles sound like a rhyme to reptiles, you know, so... Matter of fact, when I was seven years old, I wanted to become a round night table. How many of you know Arthur and the round night tables? And we have a little festival called Purim. And my mother, blessed be her memory, says, well, we're going to find you a round night table. So she went to every tailor in town. And I remember, seven years old, she coming to Feast of Purim. She's, she comes and says, go to the tailor in the corner of the city. And he have the round night table for you. Here is a seven years old boy just running to the end of the to the end of the city, and you know they had one of these dolls, you know, with the shiny armor of the round table, with the you know the face and everything is set up for me. And I got it. I was so proud. I had the shiny. I even had the, the sword. But then he says to me, "The man, wait. I have a big surprise for you." And he went and gave me an armor, you know, one of those shields. And guess what was on the shield? A cross. A ba big, fat, juicy cross. <laughs> and when I saw this cross, I started to cry there and weeping. I said, this man is trying to convert me. This man is... I ran. I remember I ran with the costume. So all the people in the neighborhood see this strange little boy running with a costume. Can you imagine coming kind of like in tights? I ran to my grandfather's house to tell him that this man is trying to give me something bad that doesn't belong to us. That was my first experience with something that is not Jewish. Twelve years later, I was in the United States, walked for the very first time into a Messianic Jewish synagogue. Name of the synagogue was the House of Joshua, Bet Yeshua in Hebrew. And I didn't know it's messianic. It was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. I thought I'm going to a regular Jewish synagogue. And what do you think happened when I walk in there? Got slain in the spirit and received the Lord? No. <laughs> As a matter of fact, what hit me is shock and horror because these people were raising their hands and they were doing this. They're washing imaginary windows. And I said, that's funny, I don't see the window. Where is the window here? They kept on saying, Yeshua, Yeshua. I said, wait a second. Who is this Yeshua? Oh, yeah, I got it. It's Joshua. You know, Yeshua is Joshua. They are praising Joshua. And they said, wait a second, why are they praising Joshua on Yom Kippur? What's going on here? And then the, the, the man came and he gave me Bible. I still carry the same Bible from me. It says Torah, Prophets, Writing, Tanakh, and the Brit Hadasha. Now, look, my mother teach me this rhyme in Hebrew. When they give you, you take. When they hit you, you run. Okay, can you say it with me? When they give you, you take. When they hit you, you run. It's a rhyme in Hebrew. So he gave me the Brit Hadasha. And he said, oh, you're one of those. You're the messy, messy kind. You turn Thursday, Tuesday to Thursday, Thursday to Friday, Shabbat to Sunday, you're confused. You're messy. Messy Yannick. <laughs> anyway, I took it. And I never read it. It was next to my dirty socks for, for several years. And one day I just opened this book to Matthew 1 1, and I start reading in Matthew 1 1. I said, wait a second, there is some problem here. He sounds like he's Jewish, this Jesus guy. He sounds like a pretty cool Jewish dude. 
Then I kept on reading, reading, and I see that the disciples, they're all Jewish. Oh my word, they all observe the Torah too. What is going on with this? And that started my journey. Today I want to talk to you about this journey and what it's related, because I think this journey will relate to you as well in this uh, story. By the way, um, I want to say a disclaimer. I'm going to assume everybody in the room is Jewish. Why? Okay? Just tend to get overly excited when they talk, in case you haven't noticed. So when we get really excited, excited you know we start to get along with one another. We just produce, in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, we just produce an Orthodox Jew and one of the leading disciples of the chief rabbis in Israel. Said I had, I had the privilege of sitting down with me to proclaim his faith in Yeshua as the Messiah of Israel. So we start producing that. Somebody called me the other week and said, wait a second. It's terrible because you guys just argue with one another. I said, you kidding? That's why we're finally getting along? <laughs> it is okay not to agree on everything. Amen? Amen? But it's important that the message of life is something we all agree upon. Amen? Amen. Matter of fact, um, it was funny. My life, I was raised up in an observant Jewish home, all of a sudden, just like that, the scales fell off my eyes. Just like you read in the Brit HaChadashah. And we uh, served, we served for um, uh, seven years uh, founder, founding a messianic synagogue here locally. One day God woke me up in a vision. He said to me, you had enough McDonald's, 299 meal. It's time for you to start having a filet mignon with me every day. <laughs> Amen? And he said, you're going to go and you're going to see how I go before you. And many of our Jewish people will come to the Messiah. So we founded the Avat Amin Ministries. Avat Amin, Hebrew mean for the love of my people. Matter of fact, our organization specifically deal with God's plan for the Jewish people. How many of you believe that God has a plan? Yes. And God doesn't change the plans. His plans are irrevocable, the scriptures tell us, for Israel. Matter of fact, look with me real quick in Deuteronomy. Let's put it up, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verse 4, it says, Even if you have been banished from the most distant land under the, under the heavens, for this the Lord your God will gather you and bring you. Now, most people think that this verse is talking about Aliyah. Yeah, right? Aliyah means to bring the Jewish people up to Israel. But Aliyah literally means to bring up, to go up somewhere. Okay? The verse here says that the Jewish people have to return, okay? And the term that it used, God says, I will go to a place in the Hebrew language, it says, Nitrei Eretz. Nitrei Eretz literally means in Hebrew, I will go to the end of the world to bring my people back to me. This is God's agenda. Have you ever had a friend that you say, I'll go to the end of the world for you? That's the way God feels about his people. By the way, if we ask the question, what the Jewish people have to return to, and why do they have to return, I want to answer this question with you for a moment. Why they truly have to return? In Psalm 96, the psalmist cry out. He said, oh, sing to Adonai, to the Lord, a new song. Sings to the Lord all the earth. Sings to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim his good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. His wonder among all the people. I want you to notice a few things about these verses. This is Psalm 96. There is only one place that I found in the Hebrew Bible. What I'm talking about, the Hebrew Bible, the, what we call the Old, the Old Testament. It's not old, it's just the Hebrew Bible. Nothing is old about the, the, uh, the Word of God, amen? amen? There's only a few places in the Hebrew Bible that you see, this is the one of the few that I found, that uses the term good news. The word for the good news is the word besorah. 
Okay? But notice in the scripture, who is the one that is going to bring the Besorah to the world? It is not going to be the nations. It is going to be the Jewish people who will bring the good news to the world. And to, to the nations. God is not done with the Jewish people. God for, forbid. And look what the scripture says. Proclaim the good news of who? The Hebrew word here is the word Yeshua. Salvation. The name of Yeshua will be proclaimed by the Jewish people to the world. How do I know it? Because my Bible tells me so that God is not done with his people. That's why the Jewish people have to return. They have to return so they can take the role of bringing Yeshua, salvation, to the world. Apostle Paul cried out and says, did God change his mind? And he says, Chas v'chalila, heaven, no. God has a plan for the Jewish people. Matter of fact, you know, I, was just, I just returned from Israel talking about plans. And we celebrated our 13th year's anniversary, my wife and I. How exciting that is. I told her after the seventh years, every year is a bonus year because we hit the years of completion. So 13, hallelujah. But my sister decided to get us a honeymoon package. Yeah, how exciting. One mile from the border with Syria. <laughs> and the night before that, there is a next special announcement. President Obama going to make announcement about the situation in Syria. You know, we sit there and say, Mr. Obama, you're not going to ruin. I rebuke you. You're not going to ruin my vacation. And then we start praying some more. And then God reminded me the word. He says, Israel will not be destroyed. The Jewish people will not be destroyed because I'm the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. So we said, we turn off the TV and say, Obama, do whatever you want. I am going to my honeymoon. <laughs> Hallelujah. God has one plan. And the reason for this plan so is that the Jewish people can take the role that God is intent, entitled, entailed for them. But a matter of fact, I want to talk to you a little bit about where we at right now, this era that we at, why we are passionate about this, why blessing Israel is important, and your role as the nations in part of it. Matter of fact, we read something interesting in the Jewish writing, in the Talmud. The Talmud says, the Tanai, you know, the Tanaic era is the era of the first century, first and second century. It says, the Tanai, the Be'eliyahu said, the world is to exist 6,000 years. The first 2,000 years are to be void. The next 2,000 years are the period of the law of the Torah. And the following 2,000 years are the period of the Messiah. Anybody know what Jewish year we are right now in? We're in the year 5774. According to the Hebrew calendar, that means that 1,700 years ago, at the very minimum, the age of Messiah had to begin. You, really, you understand that we are already in the, in the Messianic age right now. We have not seen the Messianic kingdom yet, but we are in the Messianic age. It started already. The question becomes, when the age of chaos end and the age of Torah start? Most of you say, well, the law started with Moses. Everybody know that, right? Wrong. Our rabbis tells us that it did not start with Moses, but it actually started in another very interesting uh, era. If you start from Genesis 1-1 and you count the genealogy to know when the year 2000 happened, you're going to find out two, two things. Number one, Abraham was born in the year 1948 from creation. Isn't that amazing? Something else magnificent happened in the year 1948. Isn't that amazing? But the year 2000 that started the age of Torah that led us to the age of Messiah actually started according to rabbinical writing with those words. And Abraham took Sarah 
and his brother's son and all the substance that they have gathered and the soul that they have gotten in Haran. And they went forth to the land of Canaan, into the land of Canaan, and they came. When Abraham received the Hebrew word Lech Lecha, that's where we changed from the age of chaos, beloved, to the age of Torah. He didn't start with Moses. And why this is important. I want you to pay attention closely to what the Hebrew says here. The Hebrew did not say the soul that they have gotten in Haran. The Hebrew says, this, the Hebrew term here is Asher Asu Becharan. The souls that Abraham purchased. The souls that Abraham redeemed. Actually, the literal Hebrew word here, the souls that Abraham made. Why did he make this so? What is this all about? Are you guys going to see an amazing, amazing um, picture of the messianic age? Even the word here in you, you know, in Genesis 12, 12 it says, In you, those who will bless you will be blessed. The word there in Hebrew for bless is just one interpretation. The word there, bless, nivrechu, He's from the word bricha. Bricha is actually, those who know Hebrew, know that bricha is a branch that is being cut off and he is being joined itself to a healthy tree, beloved. You want to see the entire gospel, you go to Genesis 12. Abraham took a dead tree, the nations, and he cut it because it was dead already, and he joined him to the promises and the blessings of Israel. The entire gospel is right there before of us. That's why it says Galatians 3. Script, scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham, to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you so that those who rely on faith are blessed among with Abraham, the man of faith. Isn't that a really good news, beloved? A dead branch was taken and is being brought into the promises that were given to Abraham. What a debt we have to pay to the Jewish people just for this action. If it was not through the faith of Abraham who took himself and grafted in. By the way, the Hebrew word here, it says that Abraham took. The language in the Hebrew says he took, he grafted himself in. If it wasn't for this action by Abraham and ultimately by Yeshua, the perfect Jew, none of us would be here. What an amazing debt we have to pray. You know, I'm going to tell you the truth. My organization, the organization I represent, is God organization, but you know what I mean. Avat Ami Ministries, for the love of my people, is an organization that wants to see now, as the nation has been grafted in, now it's back to our people also to return home. We deal with much opposition. One of the organizations that, that is opposing us Jews for Judaism. And you know what their slogan is? Keeping Jews Jewish. Well, I have a better slogan. How about God promises and covenants to the Jewish people? There is nothing more Jewish than accepting the Jewish Messiah. These promises are irrevocable. Matter of fact, the scripture tells us in Zechariah that ten Gentiles will hold a garment. What is a garment? A garment is a tzitzit. It's something I wear under the clothes, you know. It's a tzitzit of a Jew. And if you do the math, there will be 70 nations, ten, ten Gentiles holding the garment of a Jew. If you do the math, and there are four corners, there will be a ratio of one Jew to every 2,800 Gentiles, believers in the world. But I want you to pay attention to the scripture says that they will hold, the, not the garment, the tzitzit 
of a Jew. Why is it that the scripture says that you will wear, that you will grab the tzitzit of a Jew? It is because the Jew will not look and will not dress as Christian. He will be Jewish and he will follow the Jewish Messiah. They will act as Jews, they will worship as Jews, and they will remain Jews. Sometimes people come and ask me these questions. So, how long have you been a Christian? And I always look around, making sure they're talking to somebody else. Or somebody asked me the question the other week, how long have you been converted? How long have you been a completed Jew? And I must say to you today, in all honesty, I am a Jew. I have nothing to convert to. Instead of I have to walk into God's promises into my life. It is a okay for Apostle Paul to stand up after his conversion experience. You know, he was still called Saul. Some people say, well, he was sold and then he converted. No, nonsense. <laughs> and matter of fact, after his conversion experience, he stood up and said, I am a Pharisee. I looked up the word Pharisee in the dictionary yesterday. A hypocritical, self-righteous person. Well, I got to tell you something. Yeshua was a Pharisee too. He was a Pharisee. Don't you find it interesting, beloved, that two years, two thousand years ago, the first messianic Jewish court stood up. Yes, there was no first Baptist or first Methodist. There was first messianic. And ask the question, what are we going to do about those Gentiles? The question was not, can a Jew believe? The question was, can a Gentile believe? God help us how far we went in 2,000 years from the truth. From the sins of anti-Semitism, pogroms and inquisition. That today we ask a question 2,000 years later, can a Jew believe? Not can a Gentile believe? God help us. Brandeis University released um, a study this last week. And in the study, they suggested that 60% of Americans believe that a person cannot be Jewish if he believes that Yeshua is the Jewish Messiah. To some, the sum of this number seems encouraging because it implied that 40% believe that Jew can believe in Yeshua and to be Kosher. I love what the Jewish scholar, Rabbi Daniel Boran, says. And I bring this to you today because I want you to think about the debt that you have to pay. It says this. Daniel Boran, in the book, The Jewish Gospel, wrote, Christianity hijacked not only the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well, by turning the thoroughly Jewish text away from its cultural origins. The New Testament is much more deeply embedded within Second Temple Jewish life and taught, and taught that many have believed. Thankfully, and I say it today with all mercy in my spirit, God is not true with you. And God is not true with the Jewish people either. Isn't it good that God is a God of second chances? Think about this. In the last 40 years, more Jewish people recognize Yeshua as the Jewish Messiah than the 1960 years before that. And it is coming. So what does it mean to bless and support Israel? I was thinking about this. Paul cried out and said, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, but what is called circumcision, made in that flesh by hands, 
that, he, that at what, that time you were without Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who once were far off have been brought near to the blood of Messiah. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with, with the saints and the members of the household of God. Beloved, the Jewish people do not need to convert. It is you who have been converted. It is you who were brought in. Let us not expect the Jewish people to change who they are in the proud history of 3,000 years. It is your responsibility to adapt to this city, as Yeshua speaks in Matthew 5, to this city in the top of the hill. I want to tell you something. This city is open to the nations. It is good news. You can come in and you can get the gold key card. Hilton Honors. And be an honorary member of this city in the top of the hill. This is good news for you, no? Are you excited about this? The good news for the Gentiles is really good news. However, there is however. Often we come to this city on the top of the hill and try to change the city. Beloved, you are giving a citizenship in the city not to change the city, but to influence the city from within. Not from the outside looking in, but from the inside looking out. Imagine, you know, I, you know, I used to teach at CFNI, the Hebrew, what a joy it was. And every time the, the class was finished at 10 p.m., and I always smelled this chicken place. What is it called? <laughs> what is this place called? Oh, chick, chick, chick chicken. And boy, I was, every time I was hungry, nothing ever made me go in there. I don't have that much faith. <laughs> but imagine, imagine me inviting you to my Shabbat house, Shabbat meal. It's going to be good. And you walk in and there's the smell of the Shabbat and you see the Shabbat candle and you can... Ah. The best is on the table. And as you sit down on the table, and I'm about to serve you the first course, you pull your back from chick, chick, chicken and start to eat a $2.99 chicken. How do you think I would feel, beloved? This is the way the Jewish people feel. Do not bring your chicken into this city on the top of the hill because God has so much more for you as the nations. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen? Amen. Beloved, I want to talk to you about the reason you were brought into the city to begin with. You were brought into this city to begin with so you can play the role of blessing the natural branch and provoking it to jealousy. So God can ultimately fulfill his promises of Psalm 96. You think this is our revival? Wait till the Jewish nation find their Messiah. There will be a revival in the world. I want to talk to you about your role today because I, I hope if you hear me with an open heart that God and the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, will touch some of you in this room. I had a guest from Israel the other, the other month and the only thing they wanted to do, they said, we heard about this American experience called baseball. <laughs> so we took them to a Rangers game. And boy, they loved it. Sitting there in hot dog and the peanuts and doing much of nothing. It's the anti-Israeli game. If you ever went to a soccer game in Israel, you're lucky to come out alive. <laughs> anyway, I didn't know anything about the rule, so I had to bring a translator. Yes, somebody that explained to me the rule. I knew nothing about the game. 
And boy, we're just sitting there. I said, I don't need nothing. Nothing is happening. And then the ball fly, ball, and everybody, ah, yeah. And then something happened in this game. We got to the eighth round, also known as the eighth inning. You see, I know the language now. <laughs> and then the Rangers were winning, but the pitcher got tired. So time out. They take like a 30 minutes break in this game. Unbelievable. And they bring... And they bring to the game another pitcher. Boy, I love this job. I, I, I hit pitching for one round, and then I go home and collect the same paycheck. That is a great job. And I learned that this guy called a closer. Right? Those no blow. And I want to tell you something. This is the season that God is looking for closers, for people to come to close the deal and bring the victory home. He's looking for you today to bring this. Matter of fact, Yeshua himself says about this. You are Melach Haaretz. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt becomes tasteless, in what way will it be salty again? It is no longer good for anything, but it is thrown out and trampled by men. You are the Olam, the light of the world. A city laying in the, uh, on, a, on a mountain cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a menorah, places it under measuring basket. But it's the table that gives light in all the house. Yeshua clearly speaking on a city on the top of a hill, a mountain. What city is he referring to? He is referring to Jerusalem, friends. I, I tell you this, Yeshua is coming back to Jerusalem. And he's saying, he's giving us a mandate here, and he's saying, your mandate is not to use your salt. Now, I know if you're a professional barbecuer, like I am, I am a professional barbecuer, you know that if you take a piece of meat and you just slap it on the steak with no seasoning, it's no good. But if you do what I do, I sink to the meat, I massage the meat, I marinate the meat, I lay a hand over the meat, and season it more, and then I put kosher salt, I tell you it's going to taste better. What salt represent? First of all, do you know that salt is what makes something kosher? When you put salt on the meat, it draws out the blood. Yeshua says the salt is what makes you kosher. Kosher. And what is this salt? Salt is a, is a term, it's a generic term that refers to covenants. You remember God giving the, the Jewish people, Israelites, a covenant of salt in the wilderness? It's representation of the covenant. Notice that Apostle Paul uses the same term in Ephesians 2 and says, you were stranger, stranger to the Covenant of promise. Is that what he says? No, he didn't say you're a stranger for the covenant. He said you're a stranger to the covenants. Because of Abraham, beloved, you can partake right now of the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. All the promises, all the blessings have been given unto you. Thanks God that the Messiah took the curses, but he never took the promises. Beloved, brothers, sisters, the reason that our Jewish people have failed to see Yeshua is because we have failed to do our part in present the messianic faith in the purest form. Recently I wrote a book, The Return of the Kosher Pig. What a funny title it is. Where we put Yeshua on Jewish trial. Just last week, the book was ranked number 15, 1 5 in the Jewish categories on Amazon. Not Christian, not Messianic Jew, but Jewish category. Do you think the Jewish people do not care about Yeshua? They care greatly. They care greatly. 
think it's appropriate for me to bring back one quote from this book. Now, well, I wanted to bring one quote, but the thing stopped working. So I will give it to you anyway. It says, why is the name why the animal pig? The animal pig. Oh, here it is. Why is it called a pig? Because in the future, God will return him to Israel. Do you see, beloved? Every Hebrew word has dual meaning. The Hebrew word for pig is the same Hebrew word for the word to return. It's the same Hebrew word. Our sages told us that the Messiah is actually known by the name pig. Now think about it. Pig is something filthy to the Jewish people. But some, based on Psalm 146, it says that the Messiah, who is unkosher again, is going to come back. Oh yeah, he is going to be kosher. All right. He will be kosher again. And you know who is going to make him kosher? It is, will be the saints right now. It is us right now. 2,000 years ago, Yeshua was judged on baseless hatred charges. And it's time to reverse the course. And who is going to do it? It is going to be us together who will do it. There is a reason that God has invited you to take part of the city on the top of the hill. You receive all the perks that the Jewish people receive, all the promises and all the blessings. And in order to what? So you can bring them in. Yeshua himself cried out to say, Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim. The one who kills the prophets, the stone, having sent to you. How long I want to gather you? Like Yeladim, like children that gather their cheeks under her wing, but you are unwilling. Look, you say, your house is less desolate. For I say to you, you will not see me again, Jerusalem, until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Yeshua himself set the precedence of when he returned. I want to tell you something. Yeshua is ready in heaven today to return. He is ready. He is crying upon his people. Oh, what he is waiting for the Jewish people to say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. And it is going to be you who will become the closers in bringing this forward. Matter of fact, we now, matter of fact, Paul himself says when it's going to happen. He says, if the truma, this is Romans eleven sixteen, says if the truma, the portion offering, If the truma become whole, that the reshit, the fruit is holy, so this is also the whole. It is the root that is holy, so will be the branches. Romans eleven sixteen. What is truma? Those who know what truma, truma in rabbinic thought is two percent. When two percent of the inhabitants in Jerusalem will cry out upon him, he will come back. We are getting there. We are getting there. You're not chopped believers because the other condition that's going to happen is the fullness of the Gentiles. You realize those two, two events are parallel events? They are not sequential. They are parallel. The more that you grab to the Jewish people, the more they say, what's up with this? What is going on with them? We are living now in a supernatural season Beloved, I'm going to show you two minutes video here in a second to show you how God is working. Matter of fact, we are truly in supernatural time right now. I was in France, Paris, France, surrounded by 100,000 Jews where our organization had a chance to donate a Torah school to the first Messianic Jewish synagogue in Paris, France. When I came there, you know how I was greeted? I was greeted with tomatoes and oranges and curses. 
I can have a full feast on everything that was on me. People in the street were storing stuff at me. How dare you bring the Torah to the Messianic Jewish synagogue? But then something happened. Don't you love it when something is happening? You're going to see what happened in a second. One by one, those, those, all, those people who were throwing stuff at me were walking in. And one by one, they start to receive Yeshua as their Lord and Savior. You're going to see that in, in about one minute here. As a matter of fact, the scriptures tell us about this event because they could not connect the Torah to Yeshua. And Yeshua is the living Torah. He is the living Torah. We are living in a supernatural time. It says there on the Mount Sinai account that it came to pass on the third day when it was morning that there were thunders and lightnings and the thick clouds upon the mount and the voices of their own exceeding loud and the people that came trembled. How many of you believe that that was a supernatural event? Is God supernatural? No, let's say it again. Is God a supernatural God? Matter of fact, the scripture here does not say that there were thunders and lightning. It says in Hebrew, they heard the voices and lightnings. Now today, if you say to somebody, I hear voices, they're going to send you to the best psychologists in town. But it says here in the Hebrew that they heard voices. And not only that they heard voices, the Hebrew word to voices was misspelled in the Hebrew Bible. It's missing two vowels. Both of the vowels are missing. The sages asked the question, why the supernatural events took place and why the word was misspelled? The sages went on and explained to us the reason it's misspelled and the two verbs are missing is because there were three different voices there. The one voice is the voice of the Holy Spirit. The other voice is the voice of the Messiah that joined himself to the Father. Messiah was there in the giver of the Torah because he's the Lord of the Torah. He is Lord of everything. And he's Lord over the Jewish people. And may he be Lord over us today. We are now in a season to remember where God is going to use ordinary people like me and you to do supernatural events. In July, 1970, in July 17, 1949, beloved, they constituted in Israel what's known the sign of the hero of Israel. It's kind of like the purple art in America. Where a brigade, not a brigade, a small group of Jews, you know, after the Israel was established, stood up against the odd in the border of Syria and sacrificed their own life to save the life of thousands of Jewish people. This sign was given, and I believe it's prophetic. I researched it. You know how many people received the very first sign called the Hero of Israel? Exactly 12. Isn't that amazing? 12 men and women can change the world and the course of the nation. And I believe that there are more than 12 here. The question I want to ask you today is this generation that we're living here, is this you here? Is this the generation? Are you a generation that wants to be remembered? Matter of fact, the scriptures tells us take census of all the congregation of the children of Israel by their family, by their father houses, according to the number of the names, every male individually for 20 years old and above, all who are able go to war in Israel. You and Aaron shall number them by their armies and you there, and, and, and with you, there, there shall be men in every tribe, each one, the head of Father us. These are the names in Hebrew, Ve'ele Hashemot. You realize something? If somebody would have not fought this battle, I wouldn't be here today. Jeff Seif wouldn't be here today. 
Somebody had to fight the battle for us. And now it is your turn to fight the battle for the Jewish people to come back. Blessing Israel today is not about studying end time prophecies, but it's about taking part of end time fulfillments of this event. The question I want to ask you, do you want to be part of the, do you want just to read about the story or you want to be part of the story today? Amen? Amen. Matter of fact, I remember two years ago exactly, or, 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 or three, almost three years ago, my mother passed away and I went to Israel. And a week before my mother passed away, she received the Lord, a Holocaust survivor. And because of her testimony, I went there to her graveside among hundreds of my family members, and I read them the famous love chapter from Corinthians. And nobody knew where I was writing, reading from, but everybody was weeping. Then they found out where I was reading from, and I almost had my funeral service. <laughs> but then something happened. Just before I was about to return back to the United States, I had a desire to go to my old synagogue where I was raised up. It's an old Orthodox synagogue, Sephardic, very unfriendly, by the way. They don't let you in unless they know who you are. It's very secluded, very traditional. And when I came in, they said, who are you? And I told them my name, and they said, we don't know you. Then two minutes later, they said, come in. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. This messianic rabbi is going down today. But they were wonderful to me. The guy grabbed me by the, like this, like, uh, like that's hard. And he brought me right in front of the Torah. Right in front of the tree of life. And he said, don't move. Don't breathe. I'm thinking to myself, probably don't breathe too. And then the rabbi come. And he asked me the question. He said, do you know why are you in this seat right now, right this second? And I said, I have no idea. And I said, he said, look underneath your seat. And I look underneath my seat, and there's an inscription on the chair. And the inscription on the chair reads the following. My name is Itzhak. It says my grandfather's name. It says, this seat was purchased for life by Itzhak Shapira. That's my name. That's my grandfather's name. So one day when I will come, this seat, this inheritance will be given to me. The best seat in the house. This person has changed my life forever. You have a responsibility, beloved, to make the best seat in the house. Right there, in front of the Torah, in front of Yeshua, to your Jewish brethren. Not in the back, but the seat of honor, because they are coming. They are coming. I have one more minute. I'll just show you this video that will encourage you. It's a two-minute video, and we will close. Let's play this video. And I apologize. Just read the subtitles. I hope it will strengthen you and encourage you. And we will close. We believe Nous le croyons this Torah, que cette Torah, the living Torah Yeshua, la parole vivante Yeshua, bring revival to our people. Amen. Le renouveau à tous nos peuples. Amen.
המלך יעקב, מלך מלאכים, אתה הגדול, אתה הראשון ואתה האחרון, אין, אין אחד חוץ מישוע בנך, אבא, תפתח את עיני עם ישראל ותראה להם את האמת על בנך ישוע, אבא, ועל החטא ועל העוול שנגרם לפני אלפיים שנה, תחזיר את הצאן העובדת. את הצאן העובדת של עם ישראל, תחזיר אותם בחזרה בתשובה, במהרה, חזרה אליך, אבא, תראה להם את האמת, אבא, שאתה באת לכפר על חטאי עם ישראל ולהחזיר אותם ולהשיב אותם, אבא, שיהיו כבנים, כי יהיו ש... כילדים, אליך, אבא. אז אני מתפלל עכשיו שתפתח, אבא, יש פה כהן, אבא, הכהנים הם לפנינו, והכהנים והלוויים, אבא, תביא את הכהן הזה, את הכהן הזה, אבא, תביא אותו. שיגיע, שיבין שאין לנו מעשים, אבל יש לך חסד, אבא. כתוב בתהילים, הודו כאן לאדוני כי טוב, כי לעולם חסדו. תודה לך, אבא, שאתה, חסד, שאתה עושה חסדים, שהבאת את הבן אדם הזה לפה בשבת, ושישמע את השם של ישוע, מלך ישראל, התגדל שמך, אבא, והתהלל שמך, אבא, ושכל עם ישראל, עם אוריאל פה, ועם אחי היקר, אבא. אנחנו עומדים כולנו בתפילה, דוד, ועמנואל, ואני, ודוד, אנחנו עומדים ואנחנו מתפללים, תפתח את עיני לדם, שיראו את ישוע המשיח. אמן. אמן. הללויה. I'm sorry that you could not see all the subtitle, but this man came forward to receive the king of the world. And there was no sermon that was preached this Shabbat. It was the Spirit of God that moved. Let's close with just a word of prayer. Let's stand. Abba, in the name of Yeshua, I ask that you release anointing upon the men and women here to partake in the restoration of the house of Israel. Not just to pray for Israel, but bring a desire for this community here to bring and to see fruitfulness in Jewish salvations. I speak right now for every man, woman, and woman here that know a Jewish person, not to be silent, not to be quiet, to go and give them back what's belong to them, the name of Yeshua, salvation. Thank you. Amen. 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 Now, Rabbi Shapiro, where are you going to be right now? Where are you headed? I'm going to be in the back. We have a There's table. a table there where individuals can get the book and yeah, learn more about your ministry. Yeah. Yes. You've been sweating profusely. <laughs> you had a good time here this morning. Hallelujah. Let's give it up for Rabbi Shapiro. And uh, go back to his table, visit, get some literature. Uh, get back in here, if you would, in uh, 22 minutes, and let's hear from a man that represents a ministry that is all about blessing Israel that had 25,000 people in church last weekend. Wow. For those of you that are looking to see how you can get some traction in ministry, maybe he has some clues for you. God bless. Hallelujah. See you then.